Good morning. Good, Good to morning. see each and every one of you with us this morning. Hey, Carrie, how are you? Hey. Good, 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 good. Glad that you're with us this morning. If you're watching online, we're glad that you're here. Hope that you're having a good day today there at home. And uh, wish you were here with us. And uh, soon, maybe one of these days, we'll all be back together. So let's just start with worship this morning. Trent, lead us in worship this morning. bow at his feet he has done great things That's right. see what our Savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things yes, he, he has done great
seated as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. We've got several on our list to, to continue to be praying for, some new ones, some, some that have been on there a while. Lauren's been having some issues, so continue to be with Lauren as she's riding the waves. <laughs> How's that? Sherry Huffaker's been having some extremely bad headaches. They're running some tests, and just pray with her that God will give her some relief and that they'll find out exactly what's causing that and be able to take care of that. Several of you may remember Steve and B Brenda Vandergrift. Their house caught fire last Monday, and all they have, I don't know it's a complete loss, but it's close to a complete loss. Everybody was safe, and they were having a family cookout, and the grill caught the deck on fire, which caught the house on fire. And so, um, but they had all the family there, and they got all the family and the animals out, so... Continue to remember the, that family. Trent's dad had a motorcycle wreck this past week. He doing okay? Bruised up and broken collarbone. Um, so remember him. Uh, Cheryl's brother, Jimmy. Uh, continue to remember him. Oakley at Windsor Gardens. Marie Kennedy. Linda Minton. Aline Hall. Robert Breeden's dad. Uh, Ruth Adams. Emily Owens. Irene McGinnis. Brenda McGinnis. Irene Jenkins, Betty Floyd, Betty Cooper, uh, Karen Bowling, Virginia's friend, passed away this past week. Continue to remember her husband, Billy, uh, Roger Crow, Carrie's brother, uh, Charlie Hahn, Michelle and Jesse. And I saw that Michelle broke her ankle on, on top of everything else. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well. Keep praying for them. Sandra Franks and Jennifer Henry. Continue also to remember our government leaders, our essential workers, our educators, as they continue to do one day at a time. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we come to you this morning just seeking you. God, you've heard the requests that have been made here today. I'm sure there are so many others that we could add on to this if we really took the time. But you know all of our hearts. You know all of our minds. And you know those that that are on those on our hearts just be with each one and we'll give you the glory and the honor for all you do in the lives of those uh, god be with john today uh, god i ask that you would give him the words that we are needing to hear that will change us as we leave this place forgive us when we fail you in jesus name we pray amen And let's stand together, please, as we sing one of our great new hymns, one that we all love, is In Christ Alone. Lamentations 3.24 says, The Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my hope in Him. In Christ alone my hope is found, He is my light, my strength, my song. On a stone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depth of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. Wonderful, merciful 
Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Whoa, you rescued the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost our way. Whoa. You may, your short sitting is over. You can stand again with us as we sing together. Heaven came down and did what? You'll know in a minute. <laughs> Fill my heart. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I've wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart.
have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I be. You don't feel like it right now after that beautiful music. Wasn't that terrific music? We are blessed by that. You don't feel like it right now, but sometimes do you ever feel like complaining? Do you ever want to complain? How much time do we spend waste complaining? For our scripture reading this morning, we're going to look at the climax of one of the great passages in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 40. I would encourage you to, in your Bible study, to look at that chapter, study that chapter. It is a wonderful, pivotal chapter that played a very important part in the history of Israel. And at the beginning of the climax, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27, we're going to find that before God closes this, revi this revelation with a wonderful word of encouragement and hope and strength, he deals with something the Hebrew people were doing. They were complaining. And it was who they were complaining about that he's especially concerned with. So as we read this, Look for both those ideas, complaints and hope. In Isaiah chapter 40, beginning to read in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? Some of your translations will, will have a different word there, say, O Israel. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, some of your translations will say wait upon the Lord. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Verse 31 again. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. We're going to talk about hope today. Hope that fulfills. To fulfill his word. Continue to worship. 
church this morning.
Son, for each and every one of us here, God. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to sing together. Lord, I just ask you to be with John. Speak through him. Use him as an instrument. Let us hear from you. In Jesus' name.
Amen. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Those words were spoken by Jesus. He was defending himself against a false charge. If you'll remember, the Jewish people were very proud that they had been given God's law. Through Moses, God had given them the law on which to build their lives, their nation. Some of the rabbis, it's not in the Bible, but some of the rabbis argued that God had offered the law to all the peoples of the world and the Jews were the only ones who would accept it. Now, the Bible doesn't teach that. But it reflects the fact of how proud they were that God had given them that law. And so as the years went by and the generations passed, people had questions about the law. To define it, to apply it, what does this mean? How do I apply this? Uh, the qu sort of questions we often ask, you know, can I do this? And I can, can I not do that? And to answer their questions, their teachers over the years had developed a rather large body of explanations, definitions, and applications that were really meant to protect the law from being broken. Uh, sometimes it was called the fence around the law. Formally, it was called the tradition of the elders. And Jesus, while he, while he carefully kept the law, he said not one dot on an I or cross on a T is going to pass from the law until all is fulfilled. While Jesus carefully kept the law, Jesus did not always follow all the rules of the tradition of the elders. He made a distinction between God's law and man's rules. Some people had lost that distinction in Jesus' day. And because Jesus didn't follow all the tradition of the elders, they brought this charge against him. Now, Jesus was different. Jesus meant to be different. He said, you can't take new wine, his message, and put it in old wine skins. He was different. His disciples did not go through the ceremonial hand washing that was common among many in Jesus' day. He did not require his disciples to fast like the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees did. He, he was different. He said, my way is easy, my burden is light. He didn't always follow man's rules, but he always followed God's law. And so when he was responding to this charge, he said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. To fulfill is to bring something to its complete purpose, to apply it, to make it real in the lives of people as God has always desired. And if you want to understand the life and the ministry of Jesus, you need to understand that. Jesus understood himself to be intentionally fulfilling that which had been placed before and that he wanted to complete. Jesus was intentionally seeking to fulfill that law, to bring it to its completion. And today we're going to look at, at an encounter Jesus had with a man in which he wants to fulfill the promise and the power of hope. The Old Testament scriptures taught hope. And Jesus intentionally wants to fulfill that promise, that power. He wants to give hope to a hopeless man. He wants to show what hope will do in a hopeless person. And we're going to look at that today. John records this for us. John calls it not only a miraculous healing, he calls it a sign. And in the Gospel of John, there are seven signs. Miracles that Jesus performed that he did not just to aid someone, but to demonstrate God's truth. 
as a sign, as a demonstration. And Jesus wants to demonstrate what hope, what hope will do in your life and in my life. So let's look at this encounter and see what it will teach us about the fact that God's truth is fulfilled in hope. If you're looking for hope today, well, Jesus has it for you. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 5, in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John. We'll begin to read in the first verse, John chapter 5 and verse 1, as the Apostle records for us this encounter, rather interesting encounter, powerful encounter, in which, which John calls not just a miraculous healing, he calls it a sign. In John chapter 5, beginning to read in verse 1, the writer records for us, After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. All able-bodied Jews, especially Jewish men, were expected to attend several feasts each year in Jerusalem. And Jesus kept the law. So, after these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porticos, or porches. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, Waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately, the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Places of healing that were believed to be places of healing were common in Jesus' day. The Greeks and the Romans worshipped various so-called gods that were believed to, to have the power to heal. And there were shrines, places dedicated to them, usually associated with these places of, of supposed healing, were pools or fountains. Because the person who came in hope of healing would wash themselves, cleanse themselves as a part of the process. And a place had developed in Jerusalem that was similar to these, not dedicated to a false god, but of course dedicated to the true god. It was called Bethesda. It was a pool. And around it were five porches. Eventually, they put coverings over the porches so those who were there would be shaded from the sun. The pool was near the sheep gate. This was a gate in the northern wall through which they brought sheep to be sacrificed in the temple. And they washed them and carried them on to the temple. So we have this pool with porches. And it was believed that the first one in the water after it was stirred would be healed. So you can imagine what, what happened. Lots of people were lying on these porches around the pool. And Jesus encounters a man there. We have every reason to believe there were many people on these porches. As far as we know, Jesus only encounters and deals with one. And Jesus wants to not only help this man, he wants to use this as a sign, as a demonstration 
of the power of God, the power of hope and of faith. The man had been, the word strictly speaking means disabled, for 38 years. Now, you need to take into account that in Jesus' day, the normal lifespan for an adult was only about 40, 45 years. This man had been disabled almost, if not his entire life. And he's lying there on the porch along with these other people. And Jesus comes up to him. The Bible says Jesus knew his condition. He knew that he had suffered a long time. And Jesus wants to use this as a picture, as a demonstration. So Jesus asks him a question. It seems a very strange question, doesn't it? If, if we didn't know Jesus to be a person of genuine compassion and care, we would wonder if it was even a, almost a mocking question. Do you want to get well? The man had been disabled for 38 years. He's in the pl a place, lying by the pool. Do you want to get well? Jesus wants to do two things here. For this man and for you and me. Jesus asked that question because, first of all, he wants to remove the obstacles to hope. This man needs hope. And the first thing Jesus wants to do is to remove obstacles to that hope. Those obstacles had built up in his life over 38 years. He wants to remove the obstacles to hope. And then he wants to reawaken a God-empowered hope. Have you got those two things? This is what we're looking for today. He wants to remove the obstacles to hope. And he wants to reawaken a God-empowered hope. How does the man respond to him? We would expect the man to say, well, sure. That's why I'm here. I'm here at the pool. Sure I do. But that's not what he says, is it? The man gives Jesus two things that Jesus needs to, re to remove. They are obstacles to what Jesus wants to do. He gives Jesus an excuse, and he gives Jesus a complaint. How does he respond? Jesus says, do you want to get well? Sir, I can't get in the water soon enough. Somebody always gets in the water before I do. Why am I here? I, you want to know if I want to get well? I can't get in the water. He gives Jesus an excuse for his current situation. Excuses justify the existing situation, and so they perpetuate it. Excuses continue whatever is going on by justifying what this situation is, and so if it's justified and continued, then it removes the necessity to do anything. He asks the man, do you want to get well? I can't get in the water soon enough. Uh, a very famous football coach some years ago went to one of the Southeastern Conference schools. For years, it had had great potential, but little success. Year after year, coach after coach. When he got there, one of the first things he said to the fans was, no more excuses. No more excuses for, past, for the performance. No more excuses. We're not going to justify. We're not going to perpetuate the continuing situation. This can't become a substitute for action. The first thing that the man says to Jesus, he gives Jesus an excuse. Do you ever look for excuses? If you want to find them, you will. If you want to find an excuse, you will. If it's an excuse for not doing something God wants you to do or doing something he doesn't want you to do, the evil one will be sure that you find one. Our world is full of excuses. And if you want to find one, you will. This man responded Jesus to first with an excuse. I can't get in the water soon enough. 
And that turned into what it often turns into in our lives, a complaint. There's nobody to help me. Jesus, not only can I not get into the water soon enough, I can't do that because nobody will help me. It turned into a complaint. As I mentioned to you earlier, do you ever complain? How much time do we spend, how much time do we waste complaining? Complaints just shift the responsibility to somebody else or somebody else. Excuses justify the existing situation, become a substitute for action. Complaints shift the responsibility to somebody else. Nobody will help me, Jesus. I can't get in there. What had Jesus asked him? Do you want to get well? But what he gave to Jesus was an excuse and a complaint. These are the obstacles that Jesus needs to remove. Israel did this. There's a reason they were called a stiff-necked people. There's a reason that Moses was called the most patient man in all the world, working with them as they came through the wilderness. We see this expressed in our scripture passage today earlier in, in Isaiah chapter 40. As you know, God brought the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt, brought them through the promise, through the wilderness, gave to them the promised land, but as the generations passed, they were unfaithful. Generation after generation. Finally, in discipline, God allows them to be defeated by the Babylonians who carry the people of Judah away into Babylon for 70 years of exile. But God promised all along that he would bring them back, for he had promised them that land. This was a period of discipline. God had sort of said, go sit in the corner for 70 years. We're going to have a 70-year time out. And then the time came for them to come back, and Isaiah chapter 40 is associated with their return. It is one of the great passages in all the Bible. Read it. Study it. It begins by saying, comfort, comfort my people Israel. Your warfare is ended. Your slavery is ended. Your discipline, your time of discipline is ended. And he's preparing them to go back. And they need hope for that because it's going to be tough. It was tough. And as you come to the end of that chapter, in the passage that we read, God deals with a complaint. Why do you say, O Israel, and complain or declare, O Jacob, my way is hidden? Why do you complain, the justice do me is overlooked? They were complaining. This is what they were saying. And they weren't saying it about the Babylonians. We could understand it, suppose, if they had said it about the Babylonians had, who had destroyed Jerusalem and carried that away. They weren't saying it about the Jewish leaders, their own leaders. Who were they complaining about? They were complaining about God. Why do you say, O Israel... And why do you complain, O Jacob, my way is hid from the Lord? And the justice that is due me is overlooked by my God. They were complaining. We do that, don't we? We shift focus in another direction. Shift the responsibility somewhere else. And we complain. And whether we know it or not, sometimes we find ourselves complaining about God. And so Isaiah writes and says, this cannot be. Remember who he is. The Lord is the everlasting God. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow weary. And his wisdom is unshakable, inscrutable. Cannot be fathomed. Nothing is hidden from him. No injustice goes unnoticed by God. 
He is the everlasting God, the creator. He does not grow weary. His wisdom is beyond measure. And then he says what he wants to say. He gives strength to the weary. Did you see? Did you hear that? He of all strength gives strength to the weary. He gives hope to the hopeless. Even young men will stumble and youths will grow weary. But those who do what? Those who hope in the Lord. Some of your translations will say those who wait upon the Lord. There's reason for that. In the Hebrew language, the idea of to hope and the idea to wait, both of them are signified by the same word. They just have one word. And it can be translated to hope or to wait. The African language that we used in Zambia, Chinyanja, was the same. Kuyembekeza could mean to wait or it could mean to hope. The two of them go together. If you're hoping, you'll wait. And if you're waiting, you're hoping. And so Isaiah says to these, as God is trying to renew hope and bring them back to the promised land, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Sometimes it's easier to make an excuse. It's easier to complain. But what the writer of Isaiah wants these people to do is hope. What Jesus wants this man to do, the disabled man to whom he is speaking, he wants to reawaken a God-empowered hope. First, he wants to remove the obstacles, excuses and complaints. Then he wants to reawaken a God. In, this is not just positive thinking. Now, positive thinking is a good thing. It's not just wishful thinking. This is a God-empowered hope, a God-authorized hope. And so Jesus looks at this man who has just said, I can't get in the water. Somebody gets there ahead of me. Nobody will help me. Jesus looks at this man and says, take your bed, get up and walk. It's not about the water. It's not about other people. Take your bed, get up and walk. I am telling you, he is trying to reawaken a God-empowered hope. Is God trying to do that for you? Is he trying to reawaken a God-empowered hope? And we're sort of scared of it. Jesus wants to fulfill in this man's life. Those who wait, those who hope in the Lord, shall renew their... You see, God is impressed. God is moved by hope. If it's a God-empowered hope. Not just wishful thinking. God is moved by a God-empowered hope. God is moved by faith. My favorite account of this, we always keep coming back to Peter. Peter was an amazing individual. Matthew chapter 14 tells us that Jesus had performed a miracle, fed 5,000 people with just a little bit of food. And then he put his apostles in a boat and said, go across the lake, the Sea of Galilee. It was in the evening. He sent the crowds away. He went up to pray. They started across the lake. Matthew tells us that the wind was against them. The Sea of Galilee sits in a bowl surrounded by hills. And there are two valleys that open into it. And when the wind comes through those valleys... It funnels it into that bowl, and it can turn into a, a rough place really quick. The wind was against them. Jesus finished praying. He knew they were out there, and he came to them. If Jesus needs to get to you, he will. 
He had to walk on the water to do it. Doesn't matter. His apostles needed him. And he got there. And he's approaching the boat. And you're in this boat with Peter. And you look out and there's this figure coming, walking on the water in the night. They think it's a spirit. They think it's a ghost. They're terrified. And Jesus says, no, don't be terrified. It's just me. And Peter, what does Peter say? If it's really you, let me get out of the boat and walk on the water. Now, you and I are in the boat with him. We're saying, Peter, sit down. What in the world are you talking about? God is impressed by faith. God is moved by hope and faith. And Jesus looks back at him and says, Peter, no, I didn't come teach you that. No. What did Jesus say? One word. Come. Jesus, let me get out of the boat and walk on the water. Come. Now, Jesus didn't come to teach them to walk on water, but Jesus did come to teach them about hope and faith. And Peter gets out, and he gets, it says he got started... He just didn't get very far. He's like us. So Jesus grabs him and says, why'd you doubt? God wants to reawaken a God-empowered hope in our lives because God is moved by hope. He is moved by faith. And the man looks at Jesus, and he forgets about the water, and he forgets about the other people, and he rolls up his mat, and he stands up. Jesus has demonstrated the power of a God-empowered hope. This is a sign. Jesus is showing it to us. J. Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission, said all of God's heroes were weak, people who did great things because they believed God would be with them. He was right. What we need is hope. If it's based on God's word, if it's based on God's will, if it's a God-empowered hope, then it's a whole lot better than excuses and complaints. Because that's what we need. Maybe today you're like that man. and God, You need someone to give you some hope. Jesus gave hope to a hopeless person. And you need for him to give you that hope. He will. You're one of his. You are special to him. He will. Just listen. Set aside the excuses. Set aside the complaints. Open your heart to that hope. And however small it may be, act upon it and see what happens in your life. Maybe you're not a Christian today. You've never put your hope in Jesus as your Savior. You've heard the stories. You may believe the events. But you've never put your hope in Him and say, my hope is there for other people to see and other people to know. You can do that today. And if he needs to get to you, nothing will stop him. Nothing can keep him away. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Just like Jesus reached out and saved Peter. That's hope. Maybe you're a Christian. You've been sort of beat on. You need some hope. Reach out. God is moved by hope and faith. He will give it to you. In a moment, we're going to sing an invitation hymn. The hymn says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean. On Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. 
When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let's pray together. Lord, give us again this hope, this faith. Save us from the habit of excuse and complaint. Give us your hope, your strength to put it into practice. If there is one here who has never put their hope in you before others, you have commanded that we do this. May they come today to express that. Or a Christian that needs to pray at the altar or ask for prayer and hope. This is your opportunity to us. May we take advantage of it. We pray in your precious name. Amen. Can you have hope today? That's really not the most important question. The most important question is, will you have hope today? Let's stand together as we sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to Got a few announcements. Hey, Trey's on it. I know he's, he's going to be on it. Uh, the announcements. See? Uh-huh, he's on it. Uh, continue. We will be continuing meeting in here as long as we can and with the mask and, and those type things. Uh, remember that Wednesday night our adults meet in here and our youth be meeting at Renovate in the youth room dvds are available if you need them uh looks like mowing will probably be saturday looks like storms are coming this week so if you're planning on helping mowing you'll be here saturday at 10 o'clock uh, also the amazing grace class will meet in here and uh scott's class will meet in the youth room this morning our children are going to continue to meet outside for the most part uh as long as we can uh we hope the weather stays warm until we get a vaccine. <laughs> I know we're probably not going to do that, but we're going to try and meet with the children as long as we can possibly. Um, also, Bob Martin gave me an announcement this morning. Hey, good. There you go. Uh, that uh, anyone interested in playing some golf or attempting at playing some golf on September the 27th, which is two weeks, Two weeks from today? Two weeks from today at 1 o'clock at Whittle Springs Golf Course. So if you're interested, you check with Bob or Luke, and they will uh, fill you in on the details. Need to know by next Sunday, though, right? This Wednesday? Oh, the Wednesday before. Okay. The 23rd, I believe it is. So... Need to know by then uh, what those are. Uh, continue to remember our guidelines that have been put in place as we come in, wear your mask, face covering. You are doing a great job with that. Uh, I have been told by so many people that have said, 
Thank you for keeping us locked down like we are. Nobody likes it, but we're doing the best we can do. And uh, so we just continue to do that. So continue your mask, continue your distancing, coming in and coming out. Don't gather in the lobby. Uh, no communal snacks, coffee, donuts, or anything like that. Worship, serve, worship area is at 50%. So if you're at home and you think, eh, it's just maybe too crowded, come on, try it. See what you think. Give us a try one time. If you get feeling uncomfortable, move over to the youth room. It's overflow. So we'll be good with that. Um, maintain physical distancing, entering and exiting. Uh, don't gather in groups. Uh, don't embrace, hug, shake hands, and all that stuff. Restrooms are limited to maximum of three people at a time. No choir right now in the Bible study classes we're working on. And uh, nursery during our during our children care this morning in the mornings from 9:30 to 11. Offering plates are at the back. They will not be passed for indefinitely. And uh, anyone up on stage can take your mask off. Maintain hand washing. And all areas are being sanitized. Thank you so much for all the Lysol that has been brought in. I think we're okay right now. So just remember that, that we may be asking for more. Also, our Operation Christmas Child boxes have been ordered. They should be in in a couple of weeks. We Our goal is... It's going to be 50 again. We did 53 last year. I know that's a little stretch with not everybody being here, but if you're at home and you need a box, you call. I'll run them over to you. You can swing by here, pick them up. they would be fine. Still the same process with that. We'll fill them and have them turned in the first part of November. Continue to be giving. Giving has been okay. It's never great. It's never poor either, so just continue to be giving. We appreciate your faithfulness during this time. There are five different ways at arlingtonknoxville.com through our website. Text the amount to 84321. Mail them to the church. Drop them by the church office Monday through Friday, 830 to 1230, or call the office or call me, and I'll be glad to pick them up. We really miss you that are at home. We would love to be together, and hopefully one day we will be back together. If you need anything, those of you that are home, please contact us. We'll be glad to help. Somebody will be glad to help. We, if we don't know the need, we can't meet the need. But if you see a need, meet the need. We love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to continue to be able to do this online. Uh, just think, 10 years ago, had this happened, we would not be doing this. We would not be able to have the technology. So I'm just thankful that we do have that technology for those of you who don't feel comfortable coming back. There's no pressure for you to come back, but when you feel comfortable, come on back. Let's pray, and Lauren's going to lead us in our offertory, and then I'll tell you which sections to lead. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the, for the hope that is in you. We, we trust that you, you are that hope, and we we know that uh, if we seek you, we find hope in you. We ask that you would be with these tithes and offerings to further them uh, to the outer parts of the world and even in this community. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If this side